people can start joining immediately. Yeah, they are. Okay. So you and like my little Christmas tree on the, yep. gotta have a tree, right? <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking of embellishing a little bit further, but I stopped myself. <laughs> So welcome to those that are joining. Hope everybody survived the snowstorm. Yeah, the snow seems to be uh, dissipating. I thought it was going to be colder and they were going to last longer, but um, the streets are clean. Mm -hmm. And even though it was cold, the sun was melting stuff. It was wet. Yeah, it's supposed to be super cold tomorrow though, right? Like seven yeah, degrees when we wake up or something. I oh boy. That. I've not heard that, but uh... yeah, yeah, that does not make me happy. <laughs> but it is winter. At least we have power. Yeah, right, Kieran. That's always a good thing, right? <laughs> yeah, there's power. I was I was all ready with my generator this time, and mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yep, nothing. we were ready too. That's why. That's why we still have power. It didn't even flicker this this time nothing and it was pretty windy last night it was quite windy yeah the uh, the guys who do our plowing here uh, i was out shoveling a little bit getting the cars out and he went by and i was talking to him and he said last night was terrible he said they go out and they they plow and then the wind would blow it all back on the on the streets yeah that's rough we're up to 100 already yep 101 nice well, can i see somebody has their hand raised i'm going to see if i can I think they put it down already. Oh, they did. Okay. All right. Good. Because yeah. I was looking for it. I couldn't find it. So that's good. Thank you, Karen. <laughs> Very good. Millie Ling, will you be posting the recording? Yeah, I, I've got to get, get caught up on that, but I can email all the registrations, uh, registrants. I can email the recording of the presentation afterwards. Well, should we get going here? Yeah, 702. We get going. All right, let's do it. So welcome everybody to tonight's backyard forestry presentation, Winter Tree ID, so appropriate for today, right? Uh, my name is Lori Jensen. We're glad that you're here today. Uh, before we begin, just a few reminders. At the end of the presentation, there will be time for questions. Uh, so if any time during the presentation you have a question, uh, just pop it in the Q&A box that you'll find on the bottom of your screen. And again, those questions will be held and answered at the end. Uh, if you have any issues or you just want to stop in and say hi to us, uh, we'll be monitoring the chat box throughout the webinar, so feel free to stop in and say hi. Um, if you do experience some technical problems or whatever, if there's something we can help you out, again, just put that in the chat. Uh, and I'm going to hand the, tonight's presentation over to Andy. Andy, how are you doing tonight? Good. How's everybody? So far, I'm so good. Trying to stay warm, and I guess everybody else is too. So, welcome, welcome to Backyard Forestry in 90 Minutes for December 17th, 2020. What a year it's been. And I'm getting a note that my internet connection is unstable. But anyway, we'll move on. So, let's get going there, Lori. Let's uh, move right along. Uh oh, I'm not seeing anything. Yeah, you're freezing Anybody up a little me? bit. Oh, yeah, we, we can. Okay. You're back? Okay. Okay. Um, so here's a little bit of information about the New Jersey Forestry Association. Of course, we are the uh, host and sponsor of this program. Uh, we do have some support with other people, but uh, it gives you a little bit of history about us. We are the voice of woodland owners in New Jersey, and um, we also are reaching out to non-woodland owners now, which is part of what this program does. A list of the officers and directors. Um, uh, and as you see, uh, Kieran Hunt is joining us. Kieran is one of the directors and he is going to be our presenter tonight. Uh, some of the things that we do when you look at uh, what the New Jersey Forestry Association is all about, um, we represent uh, uh, people in, for the Forest Service. Uh, I sit on the uh, Division of Taxation Farmland Assessment Committee. You can see a number of the organizations that we belong to. Uh, also, the New Jersey Forest Service has a stewardship committee that uh, the president of the Forestry Association also serves on. So 
you know, we do, uh, we do get to intermingle, intermingle with a lot of other people. Uh, some of the things we do, uh, obviously, Backyard Forestry in 90 Minutes we do. Uh, we get quarterly newsletter. We have a website that's got information. We have an annual meeting, which is the third Saturday of March every year. Uh, we do sponsor the Woodland Stewards Program, which unfortunately was canceled this year because of COVID. Hopefully, we'll be able to get back on that next year. Um, but uh, we do represent landowners in front of the, uh, uh, you know, keep, keep track of legislative activity that's going on and things that might be important to woodland owners. And we also do a lot of other things. Uh, you know, obviously, the woodland owners, the private woodland owners, are stewards of the forests, which provide clean water, fresh air, recreation, wildlife habitat, and uh, one of the other things we do, of course, is the forestry education that we do in a number of different venues. So that's who we are. So if you are not a member, uh, we do encourage people to join. You can go to our website, shown at the bottom there, uh, www.newjerseyforestry.org. You can join there. If you join now, you become a member for 2021. So we do encourage people. Um, we are One of the other things we are doing is we are we have begun having virtual member only meetings. So in addition to um, backyard forestry, we're also having member only meetings where we are tackling issues that are of particular interest to woodland owners. Uh, January, we will be continuing backyard uh, forestry online. And then March 20th, third Saturday of the month, we will be having a virtual annual member meeting. Normally it's in person down at Rutgers, uh, given the COVID, uh, we we were canceled the 2020 meeting. Um, 2021, we will have a, a, an abbreviated virtual meeting. It'll probably start nine o'clock in the morning and go on from there. But there will be more information coming on that the agenda and more information on the annual meeting will be coming out in the next few weeks. So with that, I will turn it over to Lori to uh, present our presenter. Okay, thank you, Andy, very much. And it is my pleasure to actually introduce Kieran Hunt tonight. Uh, he is, as Andy mentioned, a member of the board, and he also has some information uh, uh, that he'll share with you on what he does. So I am going to stop sharing my screen so Kieran can take over. All right, let me get going here. And we'll start our slideshow. Can you see that all right? Looks perfect, thank you, okay. looks good. Great. So yes, once again, my name is Kieran Hunt uh, and I'm here with you tonight to talk about winter tree identification. So we're gonna focus on identifying deciduous trees or trees that drop their leaves in the winter time uh, when their leaves are not on, right? So I'm gonna get right into it here. I hope you all I've been staying warm today in this snowy weather. I've got my hot chocolate here. I hope you've got yours as well, or maybe something a little stronger. Um, so I am the municipal manager with Asplund's technical services department. I'm also an ISA certified arborist, utility specialist, and a New Jersey licensed tree expert. And I got my degree from Rutgers in ecology in 2015. And trees are my um, daily life. I work for a large tree company and I basically spend my whole time talking or writing or thinking about trees. And there's me at work inside of a tree. I like to tell people that this is an actual photo of the moment of my birth. All right, so winter tree characters. So a character in plant ID is something that you use to help identify it. So it could be uh, like the shape of a leaf, it could be the color of the twig, it could be the texture of the bark, what we're gonna go through tonight is first, we're gonna go over different types of tree characters and how we can differentiate between them to help us get down to the genus or species. And then we're gonna go through a set of examples of actual species or genera of trees and how we identify them in the winter time when the leaves aren't there. One of the things to keep in mind is that uh, generally speaking, we can't just depend on a single character to learn how to identify trees and pick them apart. We have to learn several for each tree. And it kind of becomes like recognizing a person or recognizing a face, right? Um, when we start to approach the tree, we can start to build a habit of, you know, taking a look at it from afar. And as we get closer, we start to recognize more and more about it until we can pick it out of the crowd. So for instance, this is me with a mask on, right? 2020. 
If you saw me like this, you might not recognize me if you didn't know me very well, because not all of my characters are there, right? You can't see my nose or my mouth. You know, maybe you see me at work in the field up in the bucket and you can't see a darn thing on my face at all, right? Uh, maybe only my mother could recognize me when I look like this. But the point is um, with trees, not all of our characters are present or maybe some of the ones that are present are 60 feet up in the air. There's my face all the way up in the canopy of a tree, right? Kind of hard to recognize me from there. So the point I wanna make here is that not all the characters are present, especially in the winter, right? Deciduous trees lose their leaves. And I think as humans, you know, we grow up learning to draw shapes early on. Shapes are very intuitive for us. It's easy to depend upon the shape of a leaf to learn how to identify a tree. And in the winter time, a lot of people just sort of get lost. Like, well, what am I supposed to do? And the things like bark texture and color and, you know, bud, shot, uh, bud shape and like the scales on the buds, these sorts of things aren't necessarily as intuitive to us. But if we come to know certain trees, right? Let's say there's a red maple in your neighborhood that you walk by on a regular basis. We can start to practice looking at these other characters on a tree that we know we have a positive ID on, right? I know it's a red maple. I recognize it. I see it in my neighborhood every week. And throughout the year, I'm taking a look at it. And I say, oh, you know, I never noticed that the bark has this particular texture on the four inch diameter branches, as opposed to the main stem, which is 12 inches. Or maybe I noticed that in the fall, it turns red. Or maybe I noticed that the flowers when they come out tend to have a red color as well. And as I go through my year, getting to know this tree and all of the other characters that it exhibits, when the leaves fall off and I go into the woods and I see another red maple tree, I recognize it, right? Because I've come to know it. I recognize it like I would a person. So the first character we're gonna go over is site or location. This is something that we can pay attention to before we've even started to identify a particular tree, right? If we're walking through the woods, we maybe we know the hydrology, we know if we're in a wetland, we know if we're in an upland area, we know that there's a water feature nearby. Maybe we know that the, the slope that we're on faces southwest, so it gets that really good afternoon sunlight or maybe we know it faces northeast, so it gets less good sunlight. It's mostly that cold morning sun, and that can have an effect on what species occur there, right? So you kind of have to know a little bit of the ecology of the area for site to be truly useful. And you also have to know a little bit of history, right? Because somebody could have just planted a tree there 100 years ago. But the point here is that this can be useful in finding out what trees are growing in a specific location. So I'm going to give you two really obvious examples here. There is water on the ground, right? It's a wetland. And we have a wetland species. This is um, a sweet gum, which is very well adapted to bottomlands, riparian zones. This thing likes to grow with wet feet. It's very competitive in wet environments. It grows well here. So I would expect to find it here. When I walk into that area and I see the water, I already know to be looking for swamp species, right? As opposed to on the top of a cliff, right? So this is a rope that I was climbing on. And above me, there were all these trees that are upland species, right? There was, there was white ash, there were some oaks, there were Eastern red cedars, you know, trees that don't like to have wet feet, that don't like to be growing in, in or near water. Habit or form is the general shape that the tree takes. This can be highly variable, but it's good to get to know just generally how big does the tree grow? Does it tend to retain its central stem or does it branch off into multiple main leads with no middle stem? Um, what's the architecture? What are the angles formed between branches? These are all things that we can start to pay attention to as we come to know these different species of trees. So for instance, here are two distinct types of growth habits. The one on the left, we would call um, decurrent. That means that it loses its central leader and forms multiple scaffold leads or, or separate co-dominant leads that all come up and have the child branches and twigs coming off of them, as opposed to this decurrent one on, or sorry, X current one on the right, which retains its central lead throughout the stem from the ground all the way up to the top. It has one central stem and all of its branches are coming off of that. Okay, so decurrent versus X current. And this is something that can change over the course of the tree's life. For instance, this is a pin oak. Okay, it grows straight as a pin in its youth. But oftentimes, I would say the majority of the time, not always, it'll lose that central lead once it gets to a certain height and it'll form more of a decurrent structure after that. So it also can depend on the age of the tree, okay? Decurrent loses its central lead 
X current maintains that central stem, like a Christmas tree, right? Okay, and here's another um, very distinct growth habit. This is a tulip tree. It's an upland species. It tends to grow in, it likes full sun, right? So one of the things I'm paying attention to here is how straight that central stem is. I'm also paying attention to the fact that it only has branches up in the upper canopy. This tells me that it's not very tolerant of shade, right? If, it, if, if its branches could handle shade, it would have hung on to some down here, but it hasn't. All of its branches are up in the upper canopy where they're gonna get full sunlight. So this, I would expect this to be a shade intolerant species. And on top of that, the fact that it grew so straight tells me that its primary, its primary method of deciding what direction to grow in is gravity, okay? So the, the hormone balance in that tree responds to the pull of gravity and tells the tree, you can wanna go up, go away from gravity. So this tree would be called geotropic, okay? As opposed to phototropic, which responds to the sun, okay? So if there's a gap in the canopy, it might grow up towards that gap and not worry about what way gravity is pulling. A good example of phototropism would be in the black cherry tree seen back here, right? So there's this tree out in front that's growing with a pretty straight central lead. Um, but then behind it, we have this black cherry that's exhibiting really serious phototropism, right? It, was, it grows pretty much entirely based upon where that available sunlight is in, in the gaps in the canopy. So phototropic. Most trees kind of have a balance between the two. They're not just gravitropic or phototropic. They kind of have a little bit of both, but some of them are especially prone to one or the other, and this can affect how they grow, okay? So stuff to think about as we're learning these different trees. Oh, black cherry tends to never stand up straight in New Jersey, whereas that, you know, that tulip tree pretty much always does. This is a silver maple. This is another wetland adapted species. It's pretty common for large trees um, that, that grow in wetlands to grow in a multi-stemmed form. Not all of them do this, but a lot of uh, like bottomland species that grow along the edges of water will, will naturally grow into a multi-stemmed habit. So this one kind of has this classic fountain shape or like a vase shape. This is really characteristic of silver maple. It doesn't always branch right from the ground. Sometimes it'll have a central lead for maybe five to 10 feet and then it'll form multiple uh, separate main stems that form their own canopies uh, respective of each other. But this is, I would expect to see an open grown silver maple, one that has the space to grow wide, to grow wider than it is tall. That's, that, that's common for silver maple. And this is an adaptation because of water, right? If it's growing on a water, the edge of water, it can get out into all that open space because there's no competition with trees over the water. Nothing can root in that water, so it gets all this extra sunlight out of it. Here's what I like to call the classic lollipop shape. Um, this tree is, I would call this decurrent, right? It loses its central stem right here, kind of all at once, and forms a pretty circular canopy there, right? That classic lollipop shape. This doesn't occur too much in nature, but a lot of species that grow like this along the roadside tend to form a pretty distinct oval-shaped canopy when, you, when we find them in nature. Okay, so here's just a little example of the few uh, growth forms that we've just looked at. Just to sort of think about all these different characters, right? It's not just the size of the tree. It's also how straight is the stem? Where does it lose its central lead? What are the angles that these scaffold limbs form as they branch out from their parent branches, right? Is it a lollipop? Bark is one of the ones that I think is most useful in the winter, but also the most difficult to get comfortable with, right? Like, like I said earlier, as humans, we're, we're, we naturally gravitate towards things like shapes. We like seeing things in profile, seeing that silhouette, memorizing the shape of it, redrawing it, and then we can use that to ID the tree later. Bark is a texture thing. It's how thick is it? How, how layered is it? What's the What's the color gradient within the bark? Does it just stay gray? Does it fade to brown in some areas? It kind of can get a little bit overwhelming, as you'll see in a minute. If you're not used to identifying trees based upon the bark, a lot of this is going to be like I'm speaking another language because they're all going to seem pretty similar. We're going to go through a couple of differences in bark texture and thickness just to get you a little primed on how I go about looking at trees 
for their bark, because I think this is really key to identifying trees in the winter time. Bark is always available. It's there in the growing season, it's there in the winter, and it's always available to us at eye level, right? You can walk right up to the stem of a tree. This, the main stem of the tree is never off the ground unless the tree has uprooted, right? So the bark is very accessible to us. And if we get comfortable with that texture and differentiating between these patterns, it can be extremely useful in IDing trees. Sometimes it's all you need, okay? So here we have hop hornbeam. I would call this thin bark. It really, it's not very thick. It's kind of papery, right? And it's got this vertical structure to it. It goes up and down. And I would say this has a shredded look, right? I like to say with hop hornbeam, it's got that like shreddy look. It looks like paper that's gone through a shredder. So I'm also looking at the color. So I see that the outer bark is gray, but there are these patches where the bark has exfoliated. It's, it's broken off of the main stem and that under the bark I'm seeing brown, okay? So this is the kind of stuff that I'm looking for. I'm also paying attention to this fluting. If you see the stem forms this almost like a musculature, it looks like, or like tendons under your skin, right? So this is also something we wanna pay attention to. What kind of patterns or, or um, angles are we seeing under the bark and that wood that's growing beneath the bark? Here's an ash tree, again, vertically oriented, right? Goes up and down. But this one is a little thicker. So we can see that we have these ridges on top. Is the outer bark here, I, would, I usually call ridges. And then inside, I usually call this the furrows, right? These are the gaps between that, those ridges that go down towards the inner bark. You can also call these like plateaus and valleys, right? So if you think of this like a landscape, if we were a little tiny bug and we were like moving across this landscape here, it would kind of be like being at the top of a cliff and then taking a pretty sharp angle, dipping down into a little valley, popping back up and then going across another plateau, dipping down coming back up, right? This bark is thicker than the last one. And on top of that, I'm noticing a lot of these diagonal connections between the ridges. We also call these diagonal checks and they form a diamond pattern, right? You see all these little kind of diamond looking things in the bark here. This is really characteristic to ash. Green ash and white ash both do this. They form this diamond structure. There's more, there are more species that form these diamonds than just ash, but this is a really useful ID character. Between the thickness of the bark, the fact that it's kind of got this gray exfoliating to a light blondish brown, Right, remember that blonde color because that's gonna that's gonna come up later, and these diagonal checks forming these little diamonds. This is all useful for identifying a mature ash by the bark. So here we have a tree with a very similar pattern, right? Vertical. It's got these diamonds going on. It's it's got these little diagonal checks or connections between the ridges, but I'm noticing some differences. So this is a hickory. It's not a shag bark hickory. I'm not gonna make it that easy for you. This is, uh, I believe that this one was a mocker nut hickory. And so I'm noticing that these layers are like sort of paper thin, right? I can almost see like a little potato chip texture going on up here where there's like peeling edges from the, the top layer of the bark here. And I can see areas like whole patches where that top layer has been lost. And so the bark isn't as thick over here, right? That, that top layer maybe doesn't come as high. So if I was that little bug traveling across the landscape, I'm not seeing as geometric of an angle here. It's not just a sharp turn straight down. In a lot of spots, we kind of have these rounded flatter zones. So that tells me that the bark's exfoliating a little bit. It's lost some of its height. And on top of that, I kind of want to get a closer look and say like, hey, you know, what's this like layer thing going on? Can I see that in cross section? And I kind of can, right? Like when I'm looking up at the bark, not only am I noticing just how gray this is, there's no brown in this at all. It all just goes kind of from like a slate gray down to almost black. But I'm noticing that these layers are sort of papery and, and this is pretty, pretty distinctly different from that ash tree, which didn't have any of that papery kind of potato chip look to it, right? So, and it was a lot more angular. This one's got a little bit more of a rounded softer edges to it, right? Here we have some pretty classic oak bark. So as opposed to the two that we just looked at, this one doesn't have nearly as deep little like valleys, right? This one's kind of more like a rolling hill topography. If we were a little bug moving across the landscape of this bark here, it's not, we're not falling off of cliffs into little deep valleys. We're kind of just a much softer grading between top and bottom, right? 
And I'm seeing that there's a pretty consistent coloring here. We're not exfoliating to brown underneath. It's kind of just like a grayish brownish color on top fading to a dark gray on the bottom. And it just kind of rolls along the stem. So I would say that this bark has texture, but it's not nearly as coarse or thick as the last two that we looked at. And, in, and it is still vertically oriented, right? We also totally don't have that diagonal checks thing going on forming diamonds. That's gone. We don't see that at all on this tree. All right, last one here before we move on to another character. This is black gum, Nissa sylvatica. So on first glance, you might think this reminds you of that oak that we just looked at, but these are, again, we're back to looking at plateaus with cliffs falling down, right? These, these fissures or the, these gaps between the ridges here are very deep. This bark is super thick. It's very blocky. If again, if we're like a little bug walking along the landscape here, this is like the badlands of Utah, right? We're like rock climbing to get back up to the top of this. So I want you to kind of think about this, right? Like try to look at this in perspective. When we're thinking about this texture, we're not just looking at whether it's vertically oriented. We're not just looking at like a pattern. We're looking at the thickness. We're trying to, we're, we're seeing the depth of it, okay? We want to think about at maturity, this tree forms very thick bark. I would expect that a young tree of any species is gonna have relatively thin bark. And as it matures, the bark will get thicker to some degree. Some species will hang on to those old layers of bark through for, for decades. Other species will exfoliate. And so you only have a few layers at any one time on the outside of that stem. So that helps to determine how thick that bark is. So if we just kind of compare the last four that we looked at, right? We got this ash here compared to the hickory, very similar patterns, but we have a different structure. So the hickory kind of loses those flat ridges on top and it's got a much more just like gray to black color. Whereas this ash is more brown and gray, it kind of exfoliates and has this mottled coloring going on. I don't wanna pay attention too much to the lichens or mosses growing on there because that's not the tree, right? This green stuff is not the tree. This is, these are other organisms growing on the stem. This doesn't count. We can't use that to ID it. Um, but I'm looking at that geometric angle, that sharp angle that turns down into the valleys and then these flat plateaus on top, right? As opposed to this kind of more rounded, softer edges over here. And then here we have our oak tree versus our black gum. And we're seeing that the oak has a lot, it's, it's got some coarseness to it, but it's not nearly as thick as the black gums bark, right? We have these deep cliffs in between these ridges. Okay, and the color's different. The oak's got a little bit more brown in it. All stuff to think about. So as we get used to identifying trees based upon their bark. Branch arrangement is next. This one's a little bit simpler and a little bit uh, easier to pick up on. In general, most species that we encounter in New Jersey are either going to have alternate or opposite branching, okay? Sorry, the hot chocolate break. So alternate branching means that at every junction or every axil, every spot where we form a leaf or another twig or child twig, we might say, there's only one attachment, okay? So as I'm moving down this twig, it puts off one child here, then one here, then one here, and so on. This is alternate branching, as opposed to an opposite branched tree, like this ash. When, when this parent twig forms two child branches, they, are, they come out opposite each other, right? Opposite branching. This is also true of buds. You see here, we have two buds facing each other. And if there were leaves on this, if they hadn't uh, torn them all off for this picture, you would see that there were leaves opposite each other as well. This can be deceptive because when a tree is 75 feet tall and all of its branch, all of its twigs are up in the upper canopy and it's been standing there for 50 or 100 years and the twigs are knocking against each other in the wind and some of them snap off, you're not always gonna see this really obviously from the ground, okay? So, but this can be really useful because in general in New Jersey, we can differentiate between whole groups of trees based upon whether or not they have opposite or alternate branching, right? All the oaks are alternate branched. All the maples in New Jersey are opposite branched, right? All the dogwoods, opposite branched. All the beech trees, alternate. So this can help us to pare down our options and get closer to an identification. 
For the sake of being thorough, I'm just going to mention that there are two other kinds of branching that that can they do occur in New Jersey, but they're rare, uh, at least on deciduous trees. World is one, so this has multiple attachments at each one of those junctions, kind of going around in a circle, right? Which is why they call it world. It's like circular. Whereas sub opposite is very similar to opposite, except that they're not quite lined up. They're a little offset. So it still forms two at every junction, but the junctions are kind of off by a hair, right? So just know that these exist in nature. You might need them if you're trying to use a plant key or something, but we're not gonna go over any species that do this today. All right, here's the other category that I think is really important to get used to looking for in the winter time, because this is really useful in getting down to a positive ID, especially if you know what the tree looks like during the growing season. So if you know that the tree has large compound leaves, or you know it's got tiny little leaves on it, you can expect that that'll give you some, that you can infer what the size of the gaps in the canopy are gonna be, right? If a tree has tiny little leaves, it's probably gonna have a whole bunch of really tiny little twigs all kind of jumbled up together because it needs all those twigs to put out those leaves to form a full canopy come the growing season. Whereas if a tree's got huge leaves, it's gonna have much larger gaps in the canopy because those leaves are gonna fill up a big space. So you can't have all these twigs right on top of each other. They won't be able to fit all those leaves when they leaf back out come the springtime. We wanna keep an eye out as we're looking at the texture of the canopy against the winter sky and pay attention to how dense they are, how stout they are, are they thick or are they thin? And this will give us some inference into the weight and the size of the leaves. So for instance, for those of you who aren't, aren't familiar with the different types of leaves that are out there, there are uh, simple leaves and then there are um, compound leaves, okay? So a simple leaf, like this red maple leaf, has one blade, that's this flat part here. Here comes my cat. Um, it has one blade and the blade attaches to the branch with what's called a, a petiole. That's like the little stem that attaches the blade to the branch. All right, hold on. There you go. Happy holidays. This is his punishment for interrupting me while I'm presenting. He's so um, handsome. <laughs> Sorry about that. So one blade for a simple leaf, whereas a compound leaf is gonna have multiple blades all forming a single leaf structure, okay? So this is a pignut hickory that has five blades or leaflets, and they're all connected to this central little stem on here, which is called a rachis. And that is what connects the leaf down to the twig, okay? So this little stem is part of one leaf, and each of these leaflets or blades comprise the entire leaf with that rachis and the leaflets together, okay? Simple leaf, compound leaf. In general, compound leaves are gonna be larger because there's just more to them, right? They're more complicated. As opposed to simple leaves in general will be smaller. This isn't always true, but it's a decent rule of thumb. The point I wanna make here is that when you have a big heavy leaf, you're gonna have a thick branch because it needs to support the weight of that leaf. So in the winter time, when those leaves are gone, and I see that red maple on the left, that twig is gonna, I'm gonna expect it to be much thinner than the twig on the hickory tree, which has really heavy leaves, right? So key into the thickness and also the density of the twigs. So when we're looking at the winter sky with the canopy in front of us, we're gonna pay attention to how dense, so not thick, but how dense, how numerous are the twigs against that winter sky? Is there a really tight formation of tons and tons of skinny little twigs? Because if there is, I'd expect there to be small leaves. If there are very, very big gaps and not a whole lot of twigs, it's not very dense here, but maybe the twigs look a little thicker, that's probably got compound leaves, or at least it's got big, heavy leaves, right? They might not be compound, but they're probably big. So all things being equal, because obviously if a tree is not healthy, it's not gonna have as much of a canopy, right? Unhealthy trees, they have, you know, processes like dieback and the thinning of the canopy where they have fewer twigs and branches. So that can have an effect on this look, but all things being equal, if they're both pretty healthy, I would expect a, a tree with small leaves to have denser, thinner, daintier twigs. And I would expect a tree with large, heavy leaves to have thicker, stouter twigs, but fewer of them, less dense, right? 
Twig characters are also really useful for IDing trees, especially if you're trying to use a key. But I wanna point out that you often can't reach twigs, right? If a tree is tall and you're in the forest, there might not be any branches anywhere close to somewhere that you could reach. So unless you're a tree climber and you're gonna go up and, and cut off a tiny little twig 50 feet up in the air, you're probably not gonna be able to ac access the twigs of every tree that you encounter in the woods. But for the sake of you know, getting you all used to tree identification and if you're gonna go out with a key, it's important to keep in mind some of these things that you're gonna look at. A lot of these things, if you're using a key, you're gonna need a hand lens, this little magnifying glass, right? You can get them for pretty cheap online or in a store and you just kind of hold it up to your eye like the Monopoly guy and you're looking and you can look at some really detailed information about a twig out in the field, right? So for instance, here we have a beech twig. These buds are much longer than they are wide, right? They're like maybe four to six times as long as they are wide. Uh, and they have that little like spear shape to them. I also am noticing that the bark on the twig is gray, but the buds are brown. Okay, and you, if you're looking at this under a hand lens, you can see the, the uh, texture and the orientation and the patterning of the scales on the twig. I mean, on the uh, buds here, these are all things to look at when you're practicing your ID, when you're learning a tree or when you're using a key. Here's that ash tree again. When we're differentiating between ash, ash species, which is soon to be a thing of the past, unfortunately, around here, um, one of the, one of the uh, most concrete ways of telling between green ash and white ash is looking at the buds, okay? So if we were to zoom in on this twig, we see that this leaf scar, so this is where the leaf was, and there's a scar here that forms. This leaf scar is shaped like a D as in dog, and the bud sits on top of it. They form a pretty straight line, right? If this were a white ash, I would expect this bud to be sitting inside of the leaf scar, and that leaf scar would have more of a, like a crescent moon or a C shape like cat. So if I can tell, if I can get my hands on a twig, which isn't always possible with a, with a mature ash tree, a lot of times, like I remember when I was learning tree ID, we'd come up to an ash and everybody would be combing the ground for that one twig that a squirrel gnawed off so that we could try to figure out what species it was. So that's why we don't rely on one character, right? But this is a useful ID character for ash. If we have that hand lens, this is a photo taken under my little hand lens here with my camera phone. This is an oak twig. Oaks are, are um, one of the useful ID characters for the oak genus is that they tend to have this uh, like bundle of um, terminal buds at the end of the twig. So it's got multiple buds all collected at the end of the twig here. But if we're using a key, we're also looking at the texture here. This kind of has this like almost like really short little hairs growing in here. We're looking at the scales of the buds, the colors, these other structures that are growing off. Um, I don't really use keys anymore. So I'm, I'm pretty, I'm not as familiar with the terminology as I used to be. There's like all these fancy words for the textures and stuff. But if you wanna get into that and you wanna learn your, you know, your, your trees based upon keys, you're gonna to need to get a hand lens and start looking at stuff like this. Other things that I look for are the angles formed on those child branches that come off the twig, right? These all have a pretty consistent angle going here, really tiny buds. I'm also paying attention to any um, noteworthy special structures forming on the twig. So for instance, this is a sweet gum. And this sometimes, especially when it's younger, will form what's called corky ridges on uh, the twig here. So we see these like weird little like wings coming off of the twig. This is some, some species of perennials do this, sweet gum, sweet gum being one of them. And if I see this and I notice the bud shape and a couple other things, maybe I notice it's growing in a wetland area. Maybe I see some of those like spiky balls on the ground. You know, I'm gonna say, oh, this is probably a sweet gum, right? And last thing I'll note here is that some, some trees have like a zigzag going on from, from uh, axle to axle or node to node. This can be a useful ID character as well. Some of them have that very distinctly. And then we'll just go through a couple of characters that aren't always available to us, but when they are, they can be really useful, especially in getting down to the genus and sometimes even to the species, right? So all the maples have these double Samaras, these little helicopters, right? We pick them up when we're kids, we drop them, we watch them spin to the ground. 
We learn later that the tree has that adaptation so that the, the seeds will float away from the parent tree so that they're not competing with each other, right? Tulip tree, again, these fruiting structures up in the sky can barely even see them. But even when you can't see these individual winged seeds, if we're on the ground looking up at this tree and we see all these structures that look like a tulip or like a pine cone standing straight up, they're never coming, they, they never hang down, they're always up. We can say, oh, that's probably a tulip tree because I don't really know anything else that has that structure. Or maybe we notice that there's a linden because it has this really crazy fruiting structure that has these little nutlets coming off of a modified bract. This is, this is not a leaf, it's a leafy structure that again, helps to catch the wind and helps it to kind of helicopter down away from its parent so that it's not trying to root in the shade of a, of a mature tree. Leaves, not present, right? This time of year, we're not seeing many leaves, but there are some things that we can look out for in the leaf category. One of them is what's called marcescence. This is hanging on to a dead structure. So in our case, we're talking about dead leaves. This is a beech tree. Beech trees are notorious for being marcescent, especially in their younger years. So beech and oak are the two in this area that tend to, to exhibit marcescence to some extent. Um, and so what we'll see here is these brown leaves are just hanging on to the branch that they were growing on. They are dead, but they're not gonna fall off unless the wind blows super hard. They're not gonna fall off until next spring when the new leaves come out and they'll push off those dead leaves. So some, some oaks, especially when they're young, will exhibit marcescence and beech trees tend to do this as well. This is a really easy ID character for beech because of that sort of coppery color. And we can also try to cheat and form this bad habit of looking for leaves on the ground. This isn't really a great habit to get into. You know, if you're trying to impress your friends, you gotta pretend to tie your shoes in order to use this one. But the point here is that sometimes if you're stumped, you can look on the ground and try to find some clues, right? Maybe you'll find fruit. But you got to be careful because, you know, as the winter progresses, it becomes less and less likely that you're going to find a useful leaf because they're going to start to decompose to some extent. And also it's, it becomes less likely that the leaf that you're seeing on the ground came from a tree over your head. Because as the wind blows, it moves them all over the place. And all the leaves in the area you're standing in might not be related at all to the trees that are above your head. So, but just, you know, something that you might be able to use to find a hint. So, we want to think of this as a process as we're walking through the woods, we're paying attention to what kind of growing conditions there are. Is it wet? Is it dry? Upland, downland? Is it sloped? What's the aspect? What direction is the slope facing? All these different things. And then when we start to, when we notice a tree, part of the site as well is whether or not it's growing in the shade or if it's growing up in the, in the canopy. And then we look at its form. When we're not even close to it, we can see what shape it takes, how tall it is, and as we get closer, we can start to make out things like the bark texture and color. We can start to look at those branches, both the arrangement, whether it's opposite or alternate, and how they look against the winter sky. Are there dense clusters of really skinny twigs or are there only a few very thick twigs? What does it tell us about the leaves, right? And then when we get up to the tree, when we're eye level with the bark, if we still need it, we can look around for twig characters, fruit and leaves and things like that. Hopefully though, by the time we've gotten to the, to the tree stem, we've gotten a positive ID because we focused on these four, the shape of the tree, the bark characters, the branch arrangement and the branch density and thickness. These four are generally going to be enough to get to the species and pretty much always gonna be enough at least to get to the genus. All right, so I'm gonna focus on these what is this, seven species or seven genera today. Uh, we're not gonna get through all of this. I have way too many slides. We'll get through as much as we can. Uh, please type your questions in the q and I'll get to them at the end. I'm gonna leave at least 15 minutes. So we have about a half an hour to go through as many species as we can, okay? So let's get into it. I said I'd start with, I said I'd go into ash at one of our last webinars. So we're gonna start here. Unfortunately, I don't have any good ash pictures in the winter time. Um, but now they all look like winter trees, even when it's the growing season, right? It's a bad joke. Um, so emerald ash borer is moving through our state. It's pretty much already all the way through the entire state and it's killing every ash tree it finds unless they're treated you know, with a pesticide. 
So it's important to be able to identify ash because if you've got them on your property, they are probably going to become very hazardous if they have any decent size and are near any structures or places where human would go. Um, so they tend to form this sort of oval canopy. Green ash will tend to grow a little bit wider and lose its main stem lower down on the, on the trunk. White ash will tend to grow a little taller and straighter with more of a single stemmed habit. Um, and white ash tends to grow in uplands whereas green ash tends to grow in the lowlands by water. But when we're looking for ash, we'll see that it's opposite branched, right? So it's got that opposite branching like we saw those examples of opposite branching were ash trees. And we can see this kind of oval shaped canopy, right? And as we get closer into the tree, we'll start to see some of the bark characters. So as we're walking up to a tree, um, we might notice that the bark is vertically oriented and it's got this kind of gray, gray coloring here with maybe some hints of brown in little areas. Now, as we walk up to the tree, this is the one we looked at earlier, right? Vertically oriented, diagonal checks in between. And this one's forming pretty flat ridge tops and has a pretty sharp angle going down into these valleys, okay? Vertically oriented, gray and brown, flat ridges, deep valleys with kind of a dark coloring. Here's another example from a different ash tree. Again, we're seeing that same structure there, but maybe not quite as flat on the ridge tops. It's a little bit more rounded. But we're still kind of getting this pretty sharp angle going down into these little valleys. And we're still getting those diagonal checks forming those kind of like diamond patterns, right? We gotta see a little diamond here. There's down on the ground. This is pretty common with ash. It kind of gets this waviness where the stem meets the root flare. On a younger tree, we'll expect that the bark is gonna be thinner but it's still gonna have a little bit of that structure. So as we're looking here, we're seeing those diagonal checks just starting to form, right? They're really skinny. And those valleys, so we're still getting that sharp angle, but the valleys are much shallower, right? Because the bark is younger, so it doesn't have as many layers because each of those layers increases as the tree gets older, right? As it grows, the bark gets thicker. Here, we're seeing more of that waviness like we saw where the stem met the root flare. And we're seeing some really young bark here that's very flat. It's only just starting to crack up into that vertical structure. But as we move down, we'll start to see those diagonal checks in between the ridges, okay? Young stems will be pretty smooth and they'll just start to form little cracks that are vertical and then it'll start to thicken as it gets older. I just wanted to give you a, a, a look at the compound leaves of an ash tree. So this is one leaf, it's got five leaflets. And here's the twig and we can see that it's opposite branched, right? You can see the two leaves coming off at one junction, right? Opposite each other. So we'll find that the twigs will become opposite, will be uh, opposite branched as well. And when we're looking up into the canopy, we can look for this opposite branching. One of the things that I use as a, a really useful ID character for ash, I noticed that it's opposite because it's got these really stout, thick twigs because it's got compound leaves. So it's really easy to see those twigs up against the sky, right? Because they're heavy and there aren't as many of them as on say like a maple tree. It's gonna have really dense, like a cloud of twigs. It can be hard to pick any one twig out from the crowd there. But here I'm seeing these kind of like C-shaped angles where those opposite branches form, right? All these C-shaped angles, this kind of like rounded, even where one broke off, I could see that rounded look, right? So when I'm looking at the canopy of an ash tree, this is a useful ID character for me. Not only that it's opposite, but that it's really obviously opposite, right? It's really easy to see that. On a maple tree, I gotta kind of look for it. On a tree this size, I gotta really like kind of search through the canopy for those little twigs because they're so dense, there's so many of them. And when they're knocking against each other, those skinny little twigs will break and so half the time you're not, you lost the one that was opposite the other one. So you gotta really look for it. Whereas on ash, they have these stout, sturdy twigs and it tends to retain that opposite twig character into older age. Again, for comparing the two, look at how dense the twigs are in the canopy of that maple tree. And then look at how few there are here, right? The ash tree is a lot easier to see that it's opposite and there's a lot more sky visible through that tree because the leaves are bigger. They're gonna fill in those gaps. Also, because ash are dying, I would expect to see an ash tree looking stressed out. So it may also have a thinner canopy because it's dying back because it's infested with an invasive beetle. 
This is ash, this, these are the ash fruit. They are single Samaras, so it's a winged seed, like a maple tree, but the maple ones come out in pairs, right? Like a clothes hanger, they look like. This one has single Samaras and they all kind of are coming down from in this cluster on this fruiting structure here. Real quick, I'll just go into some ID characters that have to do with emerald ash borer. So one really useful identification character for ash in New Jersey now that it's that the beetle is so prolific and almost all the ash trees are infested is I expect to see evidence of woodpecker activity on ash trees now because the ash, like they're all infested with this beetle unless they're being treated. The larvae, uh, the, basically what happens is the adult beetle lays its eggs on the outer bark. The eggs hatch, the larvae burrow into the bark and, and then under that bark, on the live phloem, the vascular tissue that conducts nutrients throughout the tree, the larvae feed on that because it's full of sugar, okay? They just eat that and they eat that and they grow and they grow and they're invisible to us because they're under the bark and they're eating this really uh, vital conductive tissue that the tree needs to survive. One beetle lays, one female emerald ash borer beetle will lay about 75 eggs and there are millions of them. So it doesn't take many beetles to kill a tree. They lay, lay all these eggs, the larvae feed under the bark, and as they're feeding, woodpeckers come around and they say, hey, I think there might be some bugs in there, and they start pecking at the bark. And we see this blonding. So remember I said, remember blonde color for that, that under bark of the ash? Well, here it is. So as we're looking up the stem of an ash tree, we'll see this evidence of exfoliation. This is from a uh, woodpecker, peck, peck, pecking away at that bark, trying to listen for a hollow spot. And when it finds one, it goes a little deeper, like it did here, and it'll pluck out that little larva and it'll eat it. So these are woodpecker marks here. This is evidence of woodpecker activity. And this is because of the way that emerald dash borer has infested all of our ash trees. This is now an ID character. We can use this to say, oh, there's woodpecker activity here. Maybe it's an ash tree because all the ash that aren't being treated basically are, they're all infested with this beetle now in the state. One thing I want to point out before I move on, just as an aside, okay, this isn't an ID thing. This is an ash tree that fell over and knocked down an entire stand of maple trees and also a power line, okay? Um, and how did it fail? It failed at the base. The main stem just popped off of the roots. So it didn't uproot. The main stem at that connection, remember that like wavy tissue I pointed out, like on the bark? Where that main stem met that root flare, it just popped off. And when I looked at it, it was all spongy and soft and weak and brittle. This is really common now. Ash trees that are infested with emerald ash borer tend to become extremely brittle and hazardous. They can form this punky soft wood anywhere. So it might be 15 feet up on the stem and there might be no outward evidence and you can't reach it with a hammer and a tap on it. And there's no way of knowing and you're up you got somebody up on your property working on the tree, cutting a branch off, and that spot that's invisible to the naked eye because it's under the bark just fails. And so he's cutting on a branch and the whole tree just fails at 15 feet up off the ground. And this is the kind of stuff that's been happening since the beetle was introduced to the country. And it continues to happen. These trees have become very volatile. They don't even have to be dead to exhibit this type of uh, decay. So I just wanna point out that if you have ash and if you're learning how to identify ash and you notice that you have one on your property, if you're not treating it to protect it from the beetle, I, I would strongly encourage you if it's in an area near a house or a road or anywhere where people gather where it's gonna be a potential hazard to people when it falls, I, I suggest that you have somebody come remove it now. Don't wait until it's dead because it becomes very expensive and very dangerous to remove these trees after they're dead because of how bad the decay process proceeds with this species after it's infested with emerald ash borer. It's a real problem for the industry. So um, do us tree guys a favor and take, it, take care of it early or treat it. Don't wait until it's a, an emergency because it's, it's gonna cost you a lot more money because we're gonna be risking our lives to take it down. Okay, rant over. Now we're gonna go into red maple. We're gonna go through a series of maples here and we'll start with red. Red maple kind of forms that lollipop shape, right? It's got this like oval shaped crown up in the in the canopy. Not super shade tolerant, right? We don't really see any lower branches here. It's mostly all up in the sun. A lot of maples that are native to the US or the native to New Jersey, I should say, are exhibit more shade tolerance in their younger years. 
And then as they mature into an adult size, they tend to lose a lot of that shade tolerance. So again, right, pretty round lollipop shape. If we look up in the canopy, we have to look a little harder, but we'll find that it's opposite branched, okay? I see opposite branching here. I see evidence of opposite branching there. I see evidence of opposite branching right here, but I gotta look for it because it's got very thin, very dainty twigs. It's simple leaves and they're not big. So these twigs don't have to be very heavy. So I gotta really look for it from the ground. When I'm looking from here, it's pretty hard to see, right? So it's not always a useful ID character. Sometimes we just can't see it unless you got a pair of binoculars on you. Another uh, common character on a mature red maple, and this is a couple other maples do this, such as silver maple does this as well. When they're mature, and especially when they're like a at least a little stressed out, like not super vigorous, you'll see this curling at the end of the twigs, right? This like little bit curl going up. So that's a useful ID character for red maple as well. And here is evidence of opposite branching, right? But look here, this one has no opposite, it broke off. Here are their opposite, I can see two there. But over here, what's this? Somewhere the branch broke off, right? So again, opposite, but this side broke off. So we gotta look for it. Red maple bark is vertically oriented. It's pretty shaggy when it gets mature. It kind of forms like half inch to an inch wide vertical plates, and they get a little bit of this shagginess going on here. So in young age, I expect red maple bark on those young branches to be just solid gray. I don't really see any brown, but as it gets into maturity, we'll see hints of a little bit of brown in here. And it gets so coarse and shaggy that sometimes it peels like a shag bark hickory. This is really common when you go upstate in the Adirondacks. I shouldn't say really common, but a lot more common than here. This is pretty rare in New Jersey, but this was taken in New Jersey here. It does happen around here. Red maple is one of the, of the species that grow in New Jersey. This one has one of the largest ranges. It grows like, I think, west of, even west of the Mississippi, down to Florida, and I think up into Canada. It's got a huge range. And so it has a huge gene pool. And so any species that has that large of a gene pool, I expect to see a lot of variation within the species, right? If you have a, like this little, this tree that only grows on one island or something, and it doesn't grow anywhere else in the world, it's got a really small gene pool. And all those trees are probably gonna look really similar. But if you have a tree that spans like half the country or half the continent, I would expect that you're gonna have a lot of variation because there's just that much more room for variation because there's such a genetic pool, right? So you're gonna see more variation. And so I would, uh, I've noticed red maple can take on some pretty distinct bark characters depending on where it's growing, depending on the growing conditions, but also like where it came from. When the tree is young, if you look over here, you see the smooth gray bark, right? Smooth and gray. And then it breaks up into this wrinkly sort of elephant skin look, right? Oh, this got cut off. I lost my, uh, I lost my picture here, but we can see it here. So smooth gray breaks up into this very wrinkly elephant skin pattern. And then as it goes down into maybe around 10 inches or so in diameter, it'll form this mature bark and these vertical plates. The, this is like a guidelines, less than six inches, smooth gray, six to 10, you get that cracking elephant skin wrinkling going on and then 10 plus shaggy. That's not like end all be all. Sometimes you'll find a tree that's six inches in diameter that's already well into that elephant skin breaking up. Maybe you'll see a 10 inch or 12 inch diameter tree that's still got some of this going on. Depends on the vigor, depends on the growing conditions and a number of other factors. Red maple twigs tend to be reddish to brown. They're not always this red. I want you to really notice though how round these buds are. You see them? Some of them are like almost spherical. They're really round. Okay, this is a useful ID character for red maple. Generally, if you're gonna see any red, it's only gonna be on this year's growth. So we see this scar here. From here to the end of the twig is where the, is how much that shoot grew this year. Behind this scar is last year's growth. The farther back you go, the grayer it's gonna be. Generally only that new year's flush of growth. And this is true for a lot of woody species. Most of the color is generally going to be on that freshest stem. Got a couple of really fancy pictures in here taken by John Hooven. Is he on tonight? I don't think John, 
John's in tonight. Well, that's unfortunate. He took some really nice photos down in the Pinelands for me for this talk. So this is one of his photos. He has a much nicer camera than me. And again, we're seeing that little bit of curling, right? And we can see those round buds. Even though we can't see them up close, we can see how round those buds are. And they're clustering, okay? Silver maple is next. This one looks really similar to red maple. They also both um, can grow in really wet conditions. They're both swamp adapted. Although silver maple, again, will tend to grow with a more multi-stemmed habit. So you see here, it got up maybe five feet off the ground and it formed its first main lead. That really is kind of its own tree, right? And then it goes up here and it's co-dominant and we've completely lost the central leader. It's multi-stemmed. And it's got that vase shape, that fountain shape to it. Silver maple, uh, one of the ID characters for me is that the twigs are very dainty. They look really thin and wispy. And so as the tree gets mature and large, it tends to almost kind of droop under its own weight. And it forms almost like a weeping habit where it'll kind of curl back down, right? So this is something to keep an eye out for. It's not just about the drooping though. It's about how like overextended those twigs look. They look just really thin and long. Red maple, the twigs will still get, they're still skinny, but they tend to not look as overextended, if that makes any sense. The bark's pretty similar to silver maple bark is vertical. It forms these like round half inch to an inch wide plates that are vertically oriented. But I always look at red uh, at silver maple as being neater. That red maple bark was pretty shaggy and kind of uh, coarse looking. This one looks like it combed its hair this morning, right? It's just got a little bit more of a tight, consistent pattern to it. The thickness is kind of like the same all the way throughout. Whereas that red maple, you could see areas where it was thicker and thinner. This one's a little, a lot more uniform and it's a pretty distinct, just like light gray. It doesn't really have as much variation in the mature bark color either. A lot of times you will see some lighter brown in between the plates on a, on a silver maple, especially if it's vigorous. But again, it's gonna be a very consistent structure here. This is where I wanna point out that like kind of wispy twig thing going on here. They're like really long and thin. But again, we've got these round buds and they're clustered at the end, okay? So this is really similar to red maple and sometimes it can be really hard to tell, tell them apart. This is not always a useful character for picking the two apart because red and silver maple can sometimes be very similar in this character. Um, if we get the bud up close, we might be able to see that the buds are a little bit more orange sometimes than red maple. And if we can get that, get our hands on it, that's usually a useful ID character is the bud color as opposed to the shape. Sugar maple, this is another native maple tree. So this, these three we've looked at so far, red maple, silver maple, and now sugar maple, these are all native to the state of New Jersey. Sugar maple also tends to form a pretty oval shaped canopy. It is shade tolerant in its adolescence and loses a lot of that shade tolerance as it grows into maturity. I don't have a whole lot of good pictures of this one either in the winter time, but I wanna focus on bark. Uh, sugar maple bark tends to be the least consistent in its patterning. So, and I mean that like on the tree itself, looking around one stem, we're gonna find a lot of variation on that stem in the thickness of the bark, in the width of the plates. We're gonna find like wide plates that form like fins coming off the stem sometimes. Like it almost looks like it's hinging off like a shingle. And then other times we're gonna find spots that just look like, like an oak tree's bark, kind of like almost smooth with, with just like a little bit of coarseness to it. It kind of looks like it can't decide what it wants to be. So here's a really good example of that. We kind of have like these spots down here where we're getting these, these edges that are just kind of peeling off. And then we have other spots like here where it's kind of just like flat with maybe just a little bit of cracks in there. And then up here, it's just smooth. So the younger bark tends to be pretty smooth. One thing I noticed about uh, sugar maple is that when it's vigorous, it tends to form uh, brown cracks in between the plates. That's showing that it's growing vigorously. It's putting out a lot of diameter growth in one year. And so you see this like separation between the plates as it grows thicker. And you'll see a little bit of brown in the middle there. And what I really focus on with sugar maple is just that coarseness and roughness and inconsistency in the bark. It's got these like big wide plates and then it's got really skinny ones. It'll have areas that look like this where there's hardly any plates at all. It's just almost like an oak tree. But then over here, it's like kind of peeling off for some reason. And then over here, there's not much going on. 
And over here, we see like the underside of one of those like fins that's peeling back off the stem. As um, if you look at silver maple, or sorry, sugar maple in the wild, I find that you tend to find a lot more of the same like wide plates, fins peeling off. You don't see a whole lot of this. This is what I tend to see in the urban environment. A lot of sugar maples just kind of, they get to like 12, 14 inches or so in diameter and they just start dying back. They can't handle a lot of the stresses of the urban environment, whether it's overwatering or it's road salt or, you know, getting whacked with a lawnmower all the time. Um, I've just noticed that they tend to stress out and crap out a lot sooner in general, not always in the urban environment um, than I notice when they're out in the woods. Here's some of that thinner young bark and you see those brown cracks, right? Where it's growing vigorously and you can see like it's, it's getting wider as it puts on diameter growth. And again, here's some of that younger, smoother bark. Another really useful ID character is how pointy the buds are. This is usually visible even from pretty far away. It kind of forms this like trident look sometimes. You'll have these like sharp pointy buds up here at the end of the twig alongside this central bud and it gets this kind of like three bud all pointy like little trident look to it but these lateral buds sometimes aren't very large at the tip like these little guys here are pretty small but it's always pretty pointy now remember when we saw the silver and the sugar maple buds they were really round here's that little trident right three pointy buds all right at the tip of the twig very characteristic of, of sugar maple so let's look at those three. We got our silver maple, a little bit more orange on that bud, but still pretty rounded. We got our, our sugar maple, which is very pointy. We have our red maple, which is like super round and has a little bit more of a red to it. Again, there's a lot of variation, especially in the red maple. This can be like almost black. It can get really dark brown to the point where they're like, the scales on the bud are like black. And in the winter time, in the dead of winter, I generally will see less color than say in the springtime or anytime during the growing season. These buds are laid out every year, so they're not gonna be uh, present all year on the tree, right? At some point, this bud is going to open up and become a flower. At some point, this bud's gonna open up and form the, the shoot growth that, that extends that branch down the way. So, but in the winter time, this is what I expect to see. Round reddish to brown buds on a red maple, round orange to brown buds on a silver maple, pointy brown buds on a sugar maple. And here's the comparison of the barks. Here's that silver maple bark that looks like it kind of combed its hair this morning. It got ready for work. It's, you know, it's, it's ready for its day. The red maple, maybe it had like one too many beers last night, but it's still good to go. And the sugar maple, which called out, okay? So very unkempt and untidy looking, that sugar maple. Norway maple is the last one maple we're going to look at today. This is an invasive. Some people will call it naturalized to be nice, um, but it does have problems in our woods, right? It's it, uh, Norway maple in the forest will sometimes form these really dense thickets. So it'll just be like hundreds of these young Norway maples growing up in a grove and they produce really dense shade and they will shade out everything underneath them. So when you see one of these groves of Norway maples growing in the woods, expect that there will be nothing growing beneath them. The ground will be bare because it's just so shady that almost nothing can grow there, all right? Norway maple is another one that forms a pretty oval canopy. In its younger years, it's kind of just a smooth gray bark, but when it gets into maturity, it forms this vertically structured, diagonal checked bark that's very reminiscent of the ash bark that we looked at earlier, right? Vertical structure, kind of little diamond shapes, but the difference is that this one, if the ash um, plates or those ridges on top were like maybe a half inch or so wide, these are more like a quarter inch, right? These are, it's a much tighter, finer texture here. Whereas on that, uh, that ash tree, it was a similar pattern, but on a, on a larger scale, it looked um, wider and a little bit looser. Really useful ID character for Norway maple compared to the other maples is that the terminal buds are really fat compared to the twig that they're growing off of. So if you remember those other buds we were looking at on the native maples, they weren't nearly so fat when we compared them to how, how thick the diameter of the twig is that they're growing on. Whereas these terminal buds in the Norway maple are really thick compared to the diameter of the twig. 
So we're comparing Norway maple bark to green ash bark. Again, we have a very similar pattern, but at a different scale. The green ash bark is wider. It's got a heavier, coarser pattern. The Norway maple bark looks like this, basically from like medium age all the way to the oldest maturity. It just kind of stays with this look, this kind of tight, vertical, little diagonal checks pattern. Again, we're looking at the comparison between a maple tree and an ash tree. This is a Norway maple. That's my timer telling me I have five minutes left. Um, so it is opposite branched, right? The maples are opposite. The ash trees are opposite as well, but it's a lot easier to see the opposite branching on the ash tree, which has those compound leaves, right? Whereas the maple, it can be really hard to tell that this is opposite. I see some of it here, I see some of it here, but all in this area, really hard to see. If we're comparing those buds, Norway maple, it's maybe two to three times wider on the bud than it is in the stem that the bud grew off of. Whereas all of these, the terminal bud is like one to two times the width of the stem that it's growing off of, right? So really useful idea character. This is also true for sycamore maple, which is also an invasive maple tree from Asia. Norway maple and sycamore maple are both in their kind of own little category of Asian maples. They look very similar, especially when they're young and especially in the winter time. American beech, I'm gonna kind of blaze through because I think this one's pretty easy to identify. American beech is very shade tolerant. It'll have branches all the way to the ground oftentimes. And American beech grows, um, it'll tend to form vegetative sprouts off of its roots. So you'll see one parent tree like we see here, and then you'll see all these little young saplings or seedlings growing up from the ground. And a lot of times these are all growing off of the roots of that same parent tree. And so technically this is all the same organism. All right, again, it's shade tolerant. So we see those lower branches, right? Branches all the way up the crown. Um, the branches are pretty long and kind of wispy and it's marcescent, right? It hangs on to these dead leaves through the winter time. Not on every tree and not all the time, but especially on these younger little saplings, we're seeing a lot of this marcescence. And this is really easy to identify when the sun's shining through the winter. I don't know if I think probably all of us, if you grew up in New Jersey and you've walked in the woods in the snow, you've seen this before where it's just white snow on the ground. The sunlight is reflecting off of these coppery beech leaves. And that's the only color, right? It's just gray bark, white ground and copper beech leaves. Really, really useful ID character in the winter time for beech. Kind of like a bronze or a copper color. Beech is, uh, it has smooth bark throughout its life unless it gets diseased. There are certain pathogens that can break this bark up, but if the tree's healthy, it's gonna be smooth whether it's a year old or a hundred years old. And so a lot of times you'll find people carving their initials on it because it's like a blank slate. And there are those like spear shaped pointy buds also really useful ID character for beech. White oak, Quercus alba. We'll go into this one oak and then we'll, we'll uh, wrap it up and we'll go into some questions. So white oak is one of our sort of most stately oaks. It can grow very large. It can really take over a big area of the canopy. Um, I wanna point out that trees growing in the woods in, in tight competition with each other will tend to grow tall and narrow and trees that are grown out in the open will tend to grow wider because they have more space to grow. But if they're in competition, every tree is trying to get up to that sunlight because they don't want their neighbor to come up and shade them out, right? Because then they'll die. So this, this white oak tree was probably grown in like a farm setting or in some condition where it was allowed to grow without competition that allowed it to grow this big and wide. And then this forest looks like it kind of grew up around that tree. All right, so uh, oaks are pretty notorious for losing their central lead, maybe about halfway up the stem on a mature tree and getting this, these really large, impressive scaffold limbs that are going out, you know, just super heavy, thousands of pounds going out way away from the main stem and forming like a whole canopy over here, right? And it's got tons of them, a lot of weight. White oak has a disease of the bark called smooth patch disease. That's relatively superficial. It doesn't do much for the health of the tree. It doesn't really have much of an effect, but it's a useful ID character. If you're anywhere in New Jersey other than in the Pinelands, if you see this, 
you're looking at a white oak. There's no other trees in New Jersey that do this, except I th I'm pretty sure that I've seen this on post oak, which is another closely related oak tree that only grows in the pinelands in New Jersey. So if you're not in the pinelands and you see this smooth patch disease where the, you know, the bark has just kind of been eaten up by some kind of little fungus, it's a white oak. When you're not looking at a tree that's diseased in that way, one of the most useful ID characters for white oak for me is this shingly appearance. So if you look here, you see how when we're looking at this in, along the edge, we can see these shadows under these layers of bark, right? It's almost like shingles on a roof or like the, the pages of a book that we're kind of looking at when you bend the book and you're looking under the page just a little bit. We're seeing this shadow here this, on this like shingly texture. That's on like medium aged branches. So it'll start off pretty smooth. And then when the branches get to around six inches diameter or so to maybe around 10 to 12 inches, they'll have this shingly appearance and then they'll break up some more and they'll form like a coarser blocky structure that's, that's vertical and then it'll stay like that for the rest of its maturity. So again, here's that shingly look, right? And then as the tree gets more mature on the stem, it forms more of a blocky vertical structure. This will just keep getting thicker and coarser as the tree matures. All right, so we got through some species. Now what I'm gonna do is move to my end slides here. Way down beneath all of these other trees. All right, so once again, we're gonna practice our ID based upon where we are, what the tree, uh, what shape the tree takes. We'll start to look at the bark textures and colors as we come into focus, branch arrangement, branch density and thickness. And if we still haven't figured it out, we're gonna start looking for some of these other things like the twig characters, fruit and flowers and leaves, things that might not be present all year. We might not need all the characters, but we we'll usually need more than one to identify a tree, especially if we're getting down to the species and it's about trying to recognize it like it was a person. I'm gonna uh, have my email address up at the end here. So if you wanna learn tree identification, you wanna buy some of these books, I can give you some recommendations, shoot me an email. Um, if you're trying to get into Bark ID, I strongly re recommend that you buy this Bark book. This book is really, really great at getting you used to picking out those textures and differentiating between species. And then this guy is from New Jersey, the author is from New Jersey. So it's all New Jersey trees. It's great. It's a really, really useful book. And that's it. Now we, I will take some questions. So let me see if I can keep this open while I also can look at my meeting controls. And yes, I can. Okay. Turn off my laser pointer. And Kara, there was only one comment in the uh, chat uh, that okay. I was uh, monitoring. And it was actually Clark that said he thought the American chestnut was also one that tended to keep some of its leaves during the winter. I think that's true. You just don't really see it that much because yeah, yeah. it's, you know, it's mostly dead. But uh, the, another, like, like we said about marcescence, right? The younger the tree is, if it exhibits marcescence, it'll tend to do it more in its younger age. So you don't really see mature chestnut. You only really see young ones in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that's true of a mature chestnut tree, but yeah, that, that, that sounds right. I've seen that before. I think I've actually seen that uh, at the Woodland Stewards program on that property. I think, we, I think we saw one that was exhibiting marcescence there. Somebody asked, is silver maple considered a garbage tree? I would say no. So Silver maple grows quickly, and most species that grow quickly tend to have uh, somewhat weaker wood. So like for instance, oak trees grow real slow and they tend to have really strong wood. Silver maple, it has a little bit more of a rapid growth habit. And so it, maybe it's not putting quite as much energy into building up those layers as, as uh, sturdily. So, but the real reason that silver maple is sometimes get a bad, gets a bad rap is because it often forms co-dominant leaves. So it'll have two stems that are growing right up against each other and pinching against each other for years. And then they break apart like a wishbone. And it tends to form decay in like really large cavities. And when it gets decayed enough on a mature tree, it will fail and sometimes it'll fail catastrophically. So it's not that it's a garbage tree, but if it's planted in the urban environment, any tree planted in an urban setting has a shelf life. It's not going to live forever. And 
if we're going to be stewards of our urban forests, then we need to manage our trees for their usable service life. So if the tree is getting large and it's capable of having a huge decay pocket and it's next to a school bus stop, we probably should remove it before it gets really hazardous, right? So it's just about managing the trees. Silver maple is native and, it, and it's uh, a vital part of our ecosystem. So I would not call it a garbage tree. Richard asked, can Kieran talk about identifying how healthy a tree is in winter? So remember when I said that uh, that one year of growth on the red maple, we could see from the scar to the end of the twig, that was our last year's worth of growth, right? The shoot growth goes from the scar from last year's terminal bud. So last year's bud that was at the end of that twig, it opened up in the spring, it grew out so much, and then it ended. And, you know, So a healthy tree will put on at least a few inches of growth on a shoot generally, unless it's a really slow growing species like a dogwood or a Japanese maple or something. If it's a tree that grows large, I would expect it to put four or six, maybe even 12 inches of growth on a, an individual shoot. And each one of those shoots in the canopy is gonna be growing however much it's growing. In general, an unhealthy tree is gonna put on shorter shoot growth. So as we get to know these trees and how much they grow per year, we can pay attention to how far apart those scars are and what the shoots look like. And if there are only buds at the very tips of the branches and there are no buds on the inside of those tips, I would expect the tree is probably more stressed out than if the tree's got a lot of buds going down the stem. Deadwood can be something to look for if you see a lot of deadwood. If there's a high ratio of deadwood to live branches in the, can in the canopy, not just like hanging onto a few dead branches like pin oaks do, but if you have a lot of dead branches up in the canopy, that can be a sign. Also, the first things to fall off of a dead twig are the buds. So if you see a lot of twigs with no buds, that's a sign that the tree is stressed out. And um, in general, the bark will get more of a flat, dull look to it. This is something that you kind of just got to get used to when you're looking at these trees. As you walk up to them, you know, it's like, hey, you look like you're not feeling so good today. Like this is all stuff that as you get to know these species, you can start to see like, hey, that tree looks sick. Like it just kind of gets like a sick look to it and some of the bark characters and the shine on the twigs and all that stuff. Is diagonal check or diamond check? I call them diagonal checks. Like a, a check being like a jump from one to the other. You know, like a little like line. Do green ash and white ash grow in the same area mixed together or would ash trees in an area be of one type? They can grow in the same area, um, but in general, I would expect to see green ash uh, be more competitive in a wetland environment on bottomlands near, near rivers and streams. And I would expect white ash to be more competitive in an upland environment. There might be some crossover in between, but I wouldn't generally expect to see a white ash growing close to a river. And I wouldn't expect a green ash generally to be growing up on a rocky hill. So there can be some overlap. The trees don't read the books that make the rules, but um, in general, they are gonna be somewhat you know, distinct with their growing conditions. Is the ash borer affecting trees in PA too? Emerald ash borer is in 36 states now, I think. It's from Michigan to Texas right now. So yeah, it's in Pennsylvania. Um, is there any similarity in the branching of a tree to the vein structure in its leaf? No. Uh, the vein structure in a leaf does not necessarily have anything to do with the branching of the tree. Um, the vein structure can have something to do with um, the structure of like the compound leaf, right? So like there are these different types of structures like pinnate versus palmate venation, which can have an effect on um, how the tree, how the leaf would look if it were compound. So for instance, red maple or any maple has palmate veins. They all come from one central point into different areas like, like the fingers on the palm of your hand. Um, and uh, box elder, which is in the maple genus, but has compound leaves, has palmately compound leaves. Okay, so leaf to leaf, there's a, there's a comparison, but leaf to branch, no, the venation there's nothing uh, that you can use. As far as I know, maybe somebody can put a comment in if they know something that I don't, but my answer would be no to that. Anthony asked, why when I climb red maple, my hands turn blue? 
Um, I would guess, I don't know this for a fact, but I would guess that there's probably a blue fungus that, uh, that gets the red maple. Either that or Anthony's just messing with me. <laughs> it's one of those two. Um, if they were turning red, I would say you should go to the doctor. Maybe you should go to the doctor anyway. Um, sugar maples, can they be tapped for maple syrup? Absolutely. Sugar maple, red maple, and silver maple can all be tapped for syrup to some extent. Sugar maple is named sugar maple because it, it, it is especially uh, productive with the sugar. But um, yeah, a lot of maples can be tapped and sugar maple is definitely one of them. That's why it's named sugar maple. What helps more with pollution? A younger tree that is growing or an older, bigger tree that has slowed in growth? It's a really good question. So um, you have to think of it on scale. So a young tree that's putting on a half an inch in diameter in growth per year, it's still only putting on a half inch diameter on this scale, right? So it's a half inch thick. So let's say a quarter inch in every one spot, right? All the way around. And how much surface area is that? And you know, how much wood is that? Compared to let's say a 30 inch tree that's putting on a 36th of an inch in growth. So it's much, much smaller, that little growth ring in the tree, but it's over a much longer distance around the circumference of the tree. So it's not a one-to-one, -one. slow growing mature trees in general are still gonna produce more ecosystem benefits than a young tree because there's just more production, right? There's more leaves performing more photosynthesis. The roots are taking up more water through transpiration all year. Uh, the tree, even if it's old and getting kind of unthrifty and not doing as well, unless it's like dying, chances are it's probably going to be doing more for all of its ecosystem services, including pollution. Um, which is why like a lot of these work ordina ordinances that are like, you know, replanting three trees because you took down one big one, even those three little trees aren't going to provide the same ecosystem benefits for decades, probably, that that one big tree did that you've taken down. Judy asked, will the bark of trees look the same in the growing season as they look in the winter? Yes, it generally will look the same. Carl asked, will there be a future session on tree pruning? Um, sure. I mean, we haven't, we haven't made that, we haven't said anything about that yet, but there could be, keep your eye out, um, maybe join us and become a member. Um, an anonymous attendee asked, can beech tree saplings be dug up and transplanted? So I don't know for sure what the answer is to this. If it grew from seed, I would say probably. Uh, I think beech is usually pretty shallowly rooted. But if it's a root sucker, if it's growing off of the root of a parent tree, if it's just a vegetative sprout, then probably not. And there's not always a good way to tell that. Unless the tree is growing all on its own and there's no other beech trees around, then yeah, maybe it could. John asked, any chance for an encore tonight or another night to see all those slides? Dude, I have even more slides than were on this, than, that were in this presentation. I have like 400 slides. Uh, it, gets long, it gets longer every year. Um, so maybe we can do tree ID part two? Yeah, or we can just do like a five hour long tree ID, you know, until you drop. Marathon. Uh, <laughs> yeah, whatever you want, until my voice stops. Oh, that question was actually from from Susan. John and Susan, I think, are both on this one th together tonight. Nice to see you both. I wish that we were all walking around outside at our winter tree ID during the Woodland Stewards update like we did last year. That was a great time. Um, don't oaks hold on to their leaves too, Irene asked. The answer is some of them do. Pin oak is the most marcescent. Black oak and red oak also exhibit marcescence to some extent. The white oaks tend to not do this as much, although they still can. Any oak can exhibit marcescence to my knowledge. Scarlet oak is another one that does it more. So all the oaks with pointy leaves, the leaves that have teeth at the end, tend to be more marcescent than the oaks that have rounded lobes. So like white oak, chestnut oak, swamp white oak, all those ones with rounded leaves tend to not hang on to their leaves in the fall. But pin oak, red oak, black oak, scarlet oak, willow oak will tend to hang on to leaves in the fall, especially when they're young. Janet said, excellent presentation, thank you. Thank you. Uh, question, if you were leading a forest tour or teaching a class of people or children who didn't know or care too much about trees, 
how would you explain the importance of identifying trees other than as an intellectual exercise? I would say that when I learned tree identification, I learned, it, I became more skilled at seeing things in the woods. So even if you don't need to know the species of trees, like if you're not an arborist, if you need, don't need to know the species so that you can figure out how to prune it, or you don't need to know it for the ecological value, or you're trying to, as a forest landowner, if you don't need to ID them to figure out which ones are invasive or whatever your purposes are, logging and timber. If you just want to get to know the natural world around you and you want to be better able to see things in the woods as you're walking through. When, when I was, I spent my whole life hiking and, and camping and running around in the woods and I did not know trees. I did not know trees at all. You know, I grew up around trees and I didn't know how to identify a maple from an oak tree at all. I knew nothing. And as soon as I started learning tree ID, I just started seeing so much more stuff. I, started, I became more capable of noticing other things in the woods than just the trees themselves. I noticed other plants. So as we learn more and more about um, the natural world around us and what we're looking at, what is that thing that I see and why does it look like that? we become more capable of asking more questions and becoming more curious and learning even more about what, what's around us. So I would say that maybe that's still an intellectual exercise. I think that's just making you better able to experience the natural world. So I think it's more than just an intellectual exercise. I think it's also about being present and, um, and having your eyes more open. Roger said, where I live, we have found spotted lanternflies recently. Me too. We have also had, we also have a lot of Alanthus trees that they prefer. Are there any controls for this insect yet? Yes, there are controls. Um, there are systemic pesticides, uh, abamectin, benz abamectin benzoate, I think is the most common right now. You can contact the state to ask them, although I think this, the New Jersey DEP has its own de dedicated spotted lantern fly page. You can report it there if it's if it hasn't been reported in your area yet. It probably has, um, and then you can purchase pesticides or not. You can't purchase pesticides. You can hire a licensed pesticide applicator uh, to to treat for that insect. I think there's a number of pesticides that you can use, but it depends on what time of year and what you're looking to do. Um, I think the Department of Ag actually has um, a sheet on their website that they do have. They have a whole thing for spotted lanternfly and there is recommendations, I believe, for homeowners and then recommendations for uh, licensed pesticide applicators. So um, that's the place to go. I don't think they need, they're not asking people to report them anymore unless it's an area where they haven't been found again, but I, I don't think that's anywhere in New Jersey anymore. So yeah, it's spreading really fast. Yep. Norman asked for an example of world or sub opposite branching. World would be like um, if you've ever seen a cedar, a true cedar, like a blue atlas cedar, uh, or a ginkgo is a really good example of world. You know, ginkgo leaves form their, the, they, they come out of the stem in a big circular pattern. There might be like 30 leaves sometimes in one spot all coming out of the same spot. Sub opposite in New Jersey, there's an invasive called um, common buckthorn, it's Ramnus cathartica is sub-opposite. In the landscape, um, there's Japanese katsura tree, Cercidophyllum japonicum, which is sub-opposite as well. But it's, that one's not invasive. How long do silver maples live, Irene asked. I don't know for sure. I think if you, if you looked in a book, it'd probably say somewhere like around 100 to 150 years. Um, but I'd have to look that up. I'm not 100% sure. Carl asked, is there any hope for the ash trees in New Jersey with the emerald ash borer infestation? The short answer is no. It's been in Michigan since the late 90s at least, and they're not coming back. They're like, it's like chestnut where they'll come up and they'll be like a sapling and then they'll, a beetle will find them and kill them. So um, in, the sh in, in the near future, probably not. They, there are researchers that are looking up how to create uh, resistance by hybridizing our native ash trees with Asian ash trees, which have natural resistance to the beetle. Uh, I think there's a, there's like a bunch of research going on with ash and trying to figure out how to get them back. But for the foreseeable future, the answer is no, there is no hope. Nancy 
asked if we can share the recording because she missed the first half. The answer is yes. Thank you. Um, Michelle said, would love to see your Macronut and Pignut bud comparison slide if there's time. Difficult to tell apart. Thanks for the great info. So as I am talking, I will try to go back to that. Richard said, tap Norway is for sugar too. Yeah, I wasn't sure about that. Thank you for that. Um, my sister asked, what is in your opinion, the coolest winter tree? My favorite uh, tree to find in the winter is um, Kentucky coffee tree. It has really huge leaves. They're like, uh, they call them bipinately compound, which means that each compound leaf has its own other compound leaf coming off of it. They're huge. The leaves are like two and a half feet long. And so when the leaves fall off in the winter, the tree looks like it's something out of a horror movie. It just has like very few branches and the twigs that it has are very thick. Uh, it's just a really cool looking tree. So, and it's got like really cool bark characters. It's just an interesting tree in the, in the winter time with no leaves. Um, when we're at the end, I will say something about this hickory slide, but for now you can look at the bark and then I'm gonna go to the twig here. Mary gave an observation. She has a silver red and sugar maple. The spotted lanternfly does not infest a sugar maple. They sit equidistant from each other. Good to know. I've heard that they go more for silver maple, but I don't, I don't know much about spotted lanternfly amongst maples. Carl said, any thoughts about ecosystem services of trees and rating scales for various species of trees? This is like, a, that, that would be like its own talk, really. Um, Different trees provide, some trees are, are specialists at cer certain ecosystem services, like a large tree that's adapted to wetlands would be really useful for getting water out of the ground if you're trying to make the site less wet, right? Um, so there's like different, it depends on the species and what type of ecosystem services you're looking for. It's also worth considering that if you're planting in an urban environment, it doesn't matter how good it is at doing uh, performing ecosystem services if it doesn't grow well in an urban setting, right? If it can't handle the heat off the asphalt and the compacted soil and all the other crap that urban trees have to deal with, even if it's like the best pollutant processor in the world, don't plant it in the city, right? Um, so I don't wanna go any more into that because we're already pretty much out of time here. We're over time really. Um, Tony asked, are exposed roots a characteristic of a tree that is dying or not necessarily? Exposed, exposed roots are characteristics of a tree that needs um, oxygen and or water and couldn't find those things deep down or found too much water deep down. So generally speaking, in the urban environment, you see exposed roots because the soil is compacted. And so not only is it hard for the roots to push through that compacted soil, it's like concrete, but also if they get to any depth, there's no oxygen there because the, the soil is so compacted that that oxygen, which needs to get down underground for the roots to survive, the roots need to breathe down there. If they're going down six, 10 inches into compacted soil, it's gonna be a wasteland. There's no oxygen down there and they can't survive. So it's a combination of how high is the water table. If the water table is two inches below the soil, expect the tree to have shallow roots because they would drown because there's no oxygen underwater. And um, if the soil is compacted, and some trees are just naturally predisposed to root more shallowly. And so they tend to have more exposed roots there as well. Some trees will expose their roots intentionally get more oxygen like bald cypress, right? It forms those knobby knees that come up out of the ground to get more oxygen. Um, so it's not a characteristic of a tree that is dying, but I will say that it's a sign that the tree is probably more prone to stress because it's got that high water table or it's got that compacted soil. So the growing conditions already aren't ideal. If it's got to expose its roots, especially in New Jersey, most species in New Jersey don't naturally just want to grow with exposed roots. You'll see it maybe in like uh, birch trees. A lot of them tend to grow in areas where they'll just have roots like above ground, like sometimes in the air, and then they go back down almost like a, um, uh, whatever you, the mangrove, you know, that you see in Florida. Um, but in general, New Jersey species don't grow with exposed roots. So there's probably something going on with the soil to cause that and it probably predisposes it to stress. It's a long answer, sorry. Anonymous attendee said, when is the best time to transplant a five foot high red oak? <sighs> February, I would say probably February. Right as soon as the ground thaws, the, before the leaves are out, 
As soon as the ground's soft enough for you to put a shovel into it is when I would transplant that red oak tree. Carl said, thank you. Irene said, fascinating, great, and very informative presentation. Oh, thanks. Um, I feel weird reading these compliments aloud, so I'm looking for a question. Oh, she would sign on for a marathon on trees. All right, I'll say that out loud. Yeah, we got yes. one. Uh, so I got to tell you, there's a bunch of talk in the chat about, so uh, I think they've decided that we're <laughs> either doing a marathon or you're breaking it up into one or two more sessions and we're doing tree pruning. So I'll it's been decided it. in chat. <laughs> you have, no, I mean, my, my, my senior project in college was, was uh, cataloging trees. And so I have thousands of pictures of trees. I have uh, just way too many. I haven't even been able to go through them. I've been out of college for five years. Um, Christopher said, how effective is emerald ash borer insecticide? Very effective. The, the most common uh, systemic pesticide, it's a trunk injection and it's good for two years. That tree is a poison to the insect. The insect will not be able to feed on the tree. Very effective, but you gotta pay every two years to treat the tree. So do you wanna spend thousands of dollars up front and remove the tree or do you have a, do you want that tree there? And so you're willing to pay a couple hundred dollars every two years to treat it because it, it's pretty expensive. Dan said, thanks, glad I tuned in. Jen said, for the annual community forestry management plan requirements. Oh, I, I don't think there's a, I think maybe the question got lost. Yeah, Karen, um, that was a, uh, Jen had asked for uh, CEUs and I was asking her what oh, type okay. of CEUs that it was. So uh, I think she's looking for the uh, New Jersey Urban and Community Forestry Credits. Um, if that's correct, Jen, yeah, we will report those back. If it's cool. something else you need, let me know. Put it back in the chat. She said, yes, thank you. Okay, perfect. And John said, just curious, are there any native examples of highly decurrent trees that are also highly geotropic? <sighs> okay, so I don't know if this is geotropism or what, but an apple tree um, will grow in a multi-stemmed decurrent habit. And then um, like if a branch falls off, and there's an exposed inner canopy, like a scaffold limb, a mature limb growing, you know, in the canopy, it'll just shoot out like 10 vertical branches sometimes, like all at once. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's just an adaptation to get out to the sun. It's not, maybe not geotropism, but I would assume that geotropism has something to do with it. Cause some of those branches, man, they just go straight up into the sky for like 10 feet. Um, so the short answer is, I don't know, but I've seen some examples of maybe that. That's the only one I can think of right now. Uh, okay, I think that's everything. So real quick for Michelle, because I like these slides too. I think they're useful. Um, Mockernut hickory tends to have more of a, um, the, the, the width of the twig tends to be similar to the width of the bud base. Whereas on a pignut hickory, I will tend to see a wider bud than twig, right? You see that comparison, twig to bud, terminal bud. The, I don't find that there's much use in trying to compare the, these lateral buds back from the end of the twig. And then real quick, pignut hickory tends to have these, um, can I get my pointer here? Tends to have these edges of the bark that are peeling off that you can kind of get your finger under, under and like flick off the tree. Whereas mockernut hickory tends to be pretty well uh, glued down. You're not really going to find many of those edges that are peeling back. So um, pignut hickory, which is caria glabra, which means smooth, actually has rougher bark. And mockernut hickory, caria tomentosa, which means hairy, has much smoother, tightly oppressed bark. Um, so yeah, those are my comparison slides. Obviously, I didn't put up shag bark because nobody needs that. Shag bark hickory is you need one character for that one, right? Just bark, that's it. Is that it, Lori? Do we have any other questions? Yeah, I think that's that's it. There's a couple of comments and everything in the chat, but I think hopefully people have been able to read that on their own because uh, I know we're kind of running uh, pretty far behind. So I think we're good. I think we're good. Well, thanks to everybody who hung in there. We're like 15 minutes over time. I apologize. I just have, I try to get in as much as I can on the slides and I figured we probably would run over on the questions. So I apologize for that. Yeah, and we will take all those comments into consideration regarding uh, uh, part two or, or some additional uh, instruction and uh, tree pruning and anything else that you think, uh, you know, you would like for us to provide, just uh, shoot us a quick email and let us know. We're happy to, 
entertain suggestions. So yeah, and definitely reach out to me if you have any questions about um, my slides or you want to look at that list of um, species or uh, books for ID mm -hmm. practice. Um, I'll send that over to you. You can email me or if you don't have my email, you can respond to Lori's email and then she'll give you my contact info. Yeah. And we will post the recording for everybody that register because uh, there's a lot of great information here. So uh, we'll get that done as quickly as we can. All right. Well, thank you, Karen. This was fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you, everybody. So, yep. So happy holidays. Uh, yep. We're going to sign off. Yeah. I hope everybody has great holidays and we will see you again oh. in January. Yes, and Karen. Congratulations for making it through 2020. Yes. I nice did it. <laughs> We're almost done. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we can do this, right? We can do this. We're almost there. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Take care. Right. Be safe, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.